how the Wednesday night group feels about that because sometimes I guess they hear it twice, but that's okay. They say repetition makes you understand and makes you uh, uh, keep it in your mind and helps you along with, uh, uh, with dealing with uh, what you've heard. So we're going to be a little bit repetitious this morning uh, because this part that we're looking at this, this morning is going to be some, some of the things that we looked at Wednesday night. So if you would turn to Colossians, you should have already moved to, to the book of Colossians. And uh, the book of Colossians is not very long, is it? How many, how many chapters are there? There's four, <clears throat> only four chapters. We're halfway through it. So you don't have too many more Sundays to listen. The Wednesday night crew doesn't have too many more Wednesday nights to put up with it either. But we're in, we're in Colossians. We're in Colossians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 through 10. I have a question for you before we read those verses of Scripture. Have you ever been told you better watch out? Anybody ever been, any, has anybody not been, ever been told you better watch out? Now my mama used to tell me that. He said, you better watch out because when daddy gets home, you know, that they added a little bit to the phrase. But when you are told you better watch out, what is that? It's a warning. It's a very, very clear warning that something is about to happen if you do something. And Paul is dealing with the Colossian church, who is a very established church, who is a very knowledgeable church. The, its members are very knowledgeable. Yet, Paul is writing this letter because some things are happening in the church at Colossae that he believes and that he knows is not right. So he begins uh, to warn them. He begins to, to hold up the uh, uh, flags and tell them that this is what is happening and you need to be watchful for it. If you found Colossians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 8 through 10. And Paul tells the, the church, Beware lest at least anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead uh, body, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Paul issues a warning to that church, and he issues a warning to us today. There are a lot of warnings that we see daily. There are a, a lot of signs around that tell us and warn us of the dangers that we might be facing. Now, there are literal signs out there, stop sign. Everybody's seen a stop sign, a yield sign, uh, a, a danger, uh, work crews ahead, uh, and, and the old standby, wet paint, you know, that's a warning as well. Uh, don't turn left, uh, no left turn, no right turn. All of those things are warnings. I bet those folks in, uh, uh, that were involved in that mud slide would have liked to have some early warning of that slide actually happening. They knew that it was possible, uh, but there wasn't anyone there shouting out to them that, that it was imminent, that it was about to happen. Uh, in Tennessee, we have early warning now of tornadoes. In fact, if you uh, have your TV on, uh, that's all that the local channels will carry uh, when when threat of bad weather is is around us, especially the threat of tornadoes. They will they will interrupt all programming and they will begin to to shout out warnings to people. You better get in your safe place because that tornado is is bearing down upon you. So we are, are faced in our own lives and in the world with uh, a lot of signs that are around us warning us of the dangers that we might face. Paul was aware, as we just said before, of some dangers, serious dangers, not just uh, uh, small dangers. You know, you might cut your, your finger on, on a knife or you might uh, uh, skin your knee if you do this or that. But Paul was uh, aware of some serious dangers that lay ahead for the Colossian church. And his warnings to the church are really alerts for us, are warnings for us 
uh, today, especially to the believers. Now, the book of Colossians is written to, to the church. It's not written to those people that are, are lost. Although all of us can benefit from Paul's writings, all of us can, can benefit from any verse of Scripture that we that we read in the Bible, whether, whether or not it is directed at us or not, we can benefit from it. But the benefit that Paul was hoping to get was to convince the Colossian church that they were, these were serious dangers that were ahead of, of them. And uh, some of the warnings that I want you to, to look at with me this morning come out of, out of these three verses of Scripture, verses 8, 9, and 10. And as always, uh, or as we've done in the past, we're not going to use the King James or we're not going to use the New King James. We're going to use the message because it, it just spells it out a little bit better, I think. I kind of like the way it, it talks. And uh, the first warning that I want us to look at is this. Make sure no one robs you of your freedom in Christ. Look at, at Colossians verse 8. And this is from the message. The message says, Watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. Are you impressed by big words? I've known some folks that like to use big words. I don't know how they ever remember. I know uh, uh, when, I, when I was working in the I was always one of the redneck uh, paramedic firefighters. And when I would, I would call in a patient report to, to one of the hospitals, I'd use just old plain old standard English, you know. But, uh, uh, you know, like, like they're, they still got a heartbeat. <laughs> but uh, some people would go, go in there and they would, they would give a patient report and say they're in VTAC, VVM with... Uh, Idioventricular, uh, with an idioventricular rhythm, and, and uh, they're, they're, uh, they're uh, I can't even think of some of them now, so I, I better quit. But we sometimes get impressed, and, and some folks think that that impresses people. Well, I was taught a long time ago that if you want someone to know what's going on, especially if it is important, you need to let them know in plain English. You need to let them know in plain English. Because you you can't mess up plain English. Well, I guess you can. <laughs> you really can't mess up plain English. There's no misunderstanding. There's no nothing that you can can de derive from it other than what is what is being said. And Paul is warning these people at, at, in that church to watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. What he is telling them is that be careful because people are out there who will tell you something that will rob you of your freedom in Jesus Christ. It will literally rob you of that freedom. And we think someone is very important by the, the way that they talk. Well, uh, sometimes uh, rednecks, and I'm, I'm a considering myself, or hillbillies, I guess hillbillies a little better. Uh, hillbilly language is, is, uh, is not too, uh, too glorious and, and we want to be impressive with people. The only thing that we need to be impressed about is the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Mm -hmm. And you can say that very simply. You can say that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. It doesn't, it doesn't take much. But it, if you want to confuse someone, start throwing the, the big words, dazzle them with intellectual double talk. Some of the things that happen in our, our society today are, are caused by people who, who use intellectual double talk and begin to draw people away from the, the main theme of God's Word. Now when you, when you read the account of Jesus, uh, I, never, I don't remember Jesus ever using a lot of big words, do you? Now he may very well have used them in the, in the Greek, he may have very well used them in, in, in the original language, but when it translates out into the English, it's not big words. It's words that point us in the direction of righteousness. And that's very, very uh, easy to understand. But when we start throwing in big words and we start throwing in uh, the theological terms, sometimes they get mixed up into what is real and what we should be 
uh, scared of. Uh, Paul goes on to say they want to drag you off into endless arguments that never amount to anything. One of the biggest barriers to God's people is getting into arguments with each other over things that don't mean anything. You know the only thing that really means anything? It's how you were born into the kingdom of God. You're born into the kingdom of God through what? Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're born into the kingdom of God because Jesus Christ paid your sin price on the cross at Calvary he covers those sins with his blood. And if you will remember your ABCs and I uh, admit, believe, and confess from vacation Bible school, hey, I get a, a star, I guess, this time. Then, uh, then you know pretty much everything you need. And there's not much of a way that we can be draw, drug off into endless arguments by those simple facts. But sometimes we get into arguments over things that really don't, ma don't matter and won't be, be worth anything. But if Satan can get a sidetrack on other things, he's won a victory. Did you know if Satan can get you to take your eyes off of Jesus for a split second or off of his message, he has won a victory because he has caused you to blink. Have you ever been in a staring contest with anybody? You know, if you, we used to do that. How long can you stare them down? And I, I knew one guy, and I, I still believe that the guy just went to sleep with his eyes open. Because he, he would never blink. But if you blink, you lose your concentration. And if you blink, guess what? Satan gets an opportunity to invade your thoughts. And you may be listening to those intellectual words and that double talk, and you may get involved in an argument that causes you to get off of the main subject, which is being born again. What was the great commission of the church? Go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Folks, that's what we are about. That's what the church at Colossae was about. But they were in danger of being led astray because they were getting involved in some of these arguments. Well, I don't really know what the arguments were, but it was an argument just the same, and it causes caused those pe people to blink. It never, and then they never mounted anything. Paul goes on to say that they spread their ideas through the empty traditions of human beings and the e empty superstitions of spirit beings. But that's not the way of Christ. Tradition. Have you ever thought, give thought, to how much of our church's service is tradition and not biblically based? Anybody have a bulletin in your hand? I don't know whether we're as deep ingrained in this as some places are. But that bulletin becomes tradition. And if you try to mess with tradition, if you try to mess with the bulletin, and, and let's say we, we move the invitation, how would you like to move the invitation to the first, first in the service? Wonder how many people would would gripe and complain. What are they? What do they mean? We get wrapped up in tradition. Baptists get wrapped up in tradition. Somebody mentioned in our Wednesday night class when I asked the question, "What are some of the traditions?" They said homecoming. It's a tradition. It's not biblically based. It's a tradition. I'll even go a little bit further. What about Sunday school? I challenge you if you can if you've got a, if you can find Sunday school in the Bible, I will give you a present. You can't find it there. It's a good thing. It's one of the best opportunities that we have to teach people 
God's word. But it's not biblically. It's not part of, of the commission that God has given us through Jesus Christ. It's a tradition. If you did away with Sunday school, there'd be rebellion across the Southern Baptist Convention. But what, what do we get involved in tradition? If tradition gets ingrained in us that we've done it that way for 20 years, we need to keep on doing it. Well, that's not necessarily so. We need to do what God leads us to do. And Paul was telling them that you're going to get bogged down by intellectual words. You're going to get bogged down by endless arguments. You're going to get bogged down by, by traditions. And those things are going to be, become your focus and you're going to lose the focus of Jesus. Christians, we need to go know that we need to get back to focusing on Christ. Our focus is not benevolence. Our focus is, is not uh, uh, Sunday school attendance. Our focus is, is not food. Our focus is not worship attendance. Our focus is Jesus. And when God's church, when God's people are focused on Jesus, guess what happens? The benevolence takes care of itself. The Sunday school takes care of itself. The worship service takes care of itself. Everything flows from that dedication to worshiping Jesus. But when we begin to get bogged down, as Paul said, this church was in danger of, with those arguments, with those uh, uh, intellectual words, double talk, and traditions, we become vulnerable because Satan has an end. You know, sometimes we do things for the right reason, but we do them wrong. You ever done anything like that? You did it for the right reason, but you later found out that even though it was right, it was wrong. We need to understand that Satan is looking for an opportunity to drive a wedge between God's people and God. And when he puts that wedge in there, guess what happens? We become more vulnerable. There was a deacon at Pleasant View Baptist Church. Uh, his son-in-law and I went out with him. To, we were in charge of cleaning up the brush. I think I've told you some of these stories. But uh, he was uh, he was a logger, and we were we were cleaning up the tops of the trees to for firewood. And uh, it always amazed me because he could take down a tree, you know, and, and put it right where he wanted to put it. I had a big old pine tree in the yard that uh, that died, got hit by lightning. And I mean, I couldn't reach around. And there was danger if it fell the wrong way, it would, it would the top of it would hit the house. So he came over, he looked at it, and uh, he said, I can take it down. He said, it won't hit your house. I said, take her down. I moved two times the length of that tree away from it. As he lit into it with that chainsaw. And he got to a certain point and he began to, to, he took the chainsaw out and he began to put wedges in there. That old tree was standing tall. And when he began to put the wedges in there, guess what happened to that tree? It began to crack. You could hear it. You could hear it cracking. And then all of a sudden, it just fell over. Those wedges were stronger than it was. Now, it didn't hit the house, but it took the satellite dish out. <laughs> A little puff of wind hit that tree and just shoved it over enough it took the satellite dish out. But that was okay. But what I'm trying to tell you is that Satan puts wedges in. And he begins to feed all those wedges and you begin to crack and you begin to lose focus. And those wedges come from double talk, arguments, and traditions. Here's another one that Paul warned them about. Make sure your beliefs are based on Christ. 
Look at in verse 9, the first few, the first sentence. Everything of God gets expressed in him or gets expressed in Christ. So, so you can see and hear him clearly. Everything you need to know about God is expressed in Christ. You don't need to know any more. You don't need to know any less. What you know about Christ, you know about God. And what we know about God we need, is based in Jesus Christ, and we need to base our relationship, we need to base our beliefs on Christ. We don't believe in, in uh, uh, angels. We, we know that they, they, they exist for the purpose of God, but they're not something to worship. We believe in uh, a lot of things, but we need to keep our focus on Christ. Some places get to get to believing in, in, in people. One of the most disappointing things you can do is to, be, to put someone higher than they need to be because, let me tell you something, every human being is just that. They're human. And if you live long enough, you will make mistakes. Bad mistakes. Bad choices. You can't afford to make a bad choice when you choose who to believe in. Our belief should be firmly placed and based on Jesus Christ. Our church should be, be firmly, firmly entrenched in Christ. Because everything of God gets expressed in you. We need to make sure we affirm, affirm the deity of Christ. If you look down at the bottom of uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, you see you don't need a telescope. You don't need a microscope. You don't need a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without Him. If we reached in, if God reached in today and pulled the presence of Christ out of this world, this world would fall apart. Have you ever thought about what might happen if, if that did take place? Let me tell you something, folks. You better understand that Jesus Christ holds this world together. You better understand that one day Jesus is coming again. Now, I don't know whether you believe he's coming soon or later or when, but I'm, I'm kind of getting to the point that I lean to sooner because of all the things that are happening in our world today. There's a lot of speculation, and this is some of this double talk that, that we get confused with and get caught up in, is what's going to happen in the end times. Well, let me tell you what I believe. And your beliefs is as good as mine. Let me tell you what I believe. I believe in the end times, when Jesus comes again, calls his church out that the Holy Spirit is going to be removed as well. And boy, when that vacuum cleaner gets through, it's going to be chaos in this world. In fact, the Bible tells us that it's going to be bad. In fact, it tells us that people will be screaming for the mountains to fall on them. That's pretty bad. We have to understand that Jesus is in charge. We have to understand that we need to make sure we affirm him because without him, there is nothing. Without him, the universe is empty. We spend millions of dollars trying to, trying to see the Big Bang Theory. There's another argument that sometimes gets people sidetracked. Well, the Bible tells us that God created the heavens and earth. I don't care how it is. It really doesn't matter to me. Well, 
What matters is that his son was there. That he was with God, he was God, he is God. And he came, humbled himself, and came and became our sacrifice for the sins that we've committed. And without him, everything that we have would be empty. Paul also tells the Colossian church, Make sure you find your fulfillment in Christ. Look at verse 10. When you come to Him, that fullness comes together for you too. His power extends over everything. We've talked about this a little before. We try to find fulfillment every day. You say, well, I don't try to find fulfillment. Yes, you do. If you get bored and you start trying to find something to do, you're trying to find fulfillment. We need to make sure that we let Jesus fill those empty spots in our life. You will not find true fulfillment in your life until you let Jesus be a part of it. You'll never feel the strength and the presence of God until Jesus is a part of your life. I've heard people say, well, going to work just fulfilled me. My job's fulfilled me too. For a few days. Then it became work. Have you ever had a hobby that you just quit because it ceased to be a hobby and became work? I've got a friend that did, did woodworking video. He did uh, uh, still pictures. He did all of those things. But what he would do, he would throw everything at it until he just wiped himself out. And then he was found out he wasn't fulfilled. Folks, God will, I mean, Satan will try to tell you that there's other ways to fulfill your life other than Jesus. Guess what? He told, told that same story to Adam and Eve. You know, awful tempting to be like God, wouldn't it? And some of you say, oh, if I'd been them, I never would have done it. Yeah, you would. The children of Israel set free out of Egypt. God provided leadership. He provided a path. He provided food and water. And what did they do? They grumbled. They grumbled. We're not being fulfilled. God was fulfilling every promise that he had made and they, they did not look for anything. We move into the New Testament. Jesus is born. The King of King and Lord of Lords was born. Now you want a good example of, of these things that we've talked about today. Look at Israel. When Jesus was born. There he was. <coughs> laying in that manger. In that stable. The king of king. And lord of lords. But what did the Jews see? A crucifixion. 
crummy little baby that was born in a stable. Lowly, no account. Wouldn't amount to anything. But you notice that the leader of that day became just a little bit afraid. And what happened? Jesus had to flee. His parents had to flee. He came back with another opportunity. He began preaching the word. Here we go back to to traditions. The Jews had done it all, but all this time, we we go back many, many years, and, and here's this man coming with something brand new. It's not true. They did everything to destroy him. And finally nailed him on a cross. But he showed them. He showed them that he was God. He rose again the third day. And he did so so that you might be fulfilled. Fulfilled not with the things of this world, but with the things of God. Make sure you find your fulfillment in Christ. When you come to Him, that fullness comes together for you too. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior this morning, the only way that you will ever have fulfillment of your life is to come to know Him as Lord and Savior. Remember the ABCs? Admit, believe, and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What do you believe this morning? Folks, you better, better watch out. Satan's out to get you. But Jesus is out to save you. Won't you hold up your hand this morning and receive him as your personal Savior? Father, thank you for the love that you have for us. And God, it just amazes me how you can love us when most of the time we just don't exhibit a love for you. We don't respect your house. We don't respect your son's sacrifice. Yet you still offer us grace and mercy. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that that grace and mercy will overshadow someone in this congregation today. And that Heavenly Father, if they don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, they will come to know Him before they leave here this morning. I also pray, Heavenly Father, that the Holy Spirit would overshadow the Christians that are here. And help us to just see, just see what our relationship is with you. Father, we might be saved, but we might not be serving as you would have us to serve. We, not, we might not be giving you the glory that you deserve. Father, I pray that you convict us all of what we need to do to be right in your sight. And Father, as we offer this invitation this morning, this is an opportunity for, for all of us to come to your altar, to pray, confess, rededicate. And Father, as the Holy Spirit leads, I pray people will come. Help us to see the warning signs in front of us and turn to the only true Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Father, bless us as we stand, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If God has spoken to you this morning and you feel you need to come for whatever reason,